Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's American Culture on Appeal series event at this beautiful location. We also welcome our audience members who are joining in online. My name is Rebecca Holdenreed, and I am the External Relations Director at ADF. Alliance Defending, Defending Freedom is the largest public interest law firm in the world focused on defending religious liberty and freedom of conscience rights. We have an extensive Supreme Court practice, which includes nine victories since 2011. The Supreme Court will also hear another important case this term, Harris Funeral Homes versus the Equal, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This is a Title VII case that will be discussed during the second panel today. Today, we also want to pay tribute to Constitution Day, which is officially tomorrow, September 17th. It will be the 232nd anniversary of the day that commemorates the formation and signing of the US Constitution by those 39 signers. We at ADF are so very thankful that this very document that protects our mission to defend our first freedoms can continue to be honored and defended as the basis of our American framework. Now, I'd also like to thank the wonderful panelist and journalist moderator today for all coming together with us and providing what we know will be a helpful and enlightening conversation on the Supreme Court terms. Our first panel today is titled Veterans, Memorials, and Prayer, a discussion on Bladensburg and what's ahead for the Establishment Clause. This panel will focus on the past Supreme Court terms, specifically American Legion versus American Humanist Association, and also provide a brief discussion on the United States Aid Funds for Espinoza case that was just granted. The panelists in their intro remarks will describe in full, fuller detail the facts of these cases. Here today to guide us through the Establishment Clause questions are three top-notch civil rights attorneys and influencers and moderated by a Supreme Court journalist. Let's start with the attorneys. Their full bios are also on your handouts, so I will try to keep their introductions brief today. Um, beginning with my very left is Caitlin Rohalt. Caitlin is an associate at Jones Day. Caitlin was part of the team of Jones Day attorneys that successfully defended the Bladensburg Peace Cross at the Fourth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. She formerly served as a law clerk for Judge, Judge Steve Culleton on the Eighth Circuit and Judge Richard Leon on the DC Circuit. She also served as a special counsel to the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee for the nomination of Justice Neil Gorsuch to the United States Supreme Court. Also on the panel is David Cortman. Dave serves as senior counsel and vice president of US litigation with Alliance Defending Freedom. He has successfully litigated over 200 cases at every level, including recent victories at the Federal Courts of Appeals and the US Supreme Court, where he argued a 9-0 victory in Reed versus Gilbert and a 7-2 victory in Trinity Lutheran versus Comer. Charles Rothfield with us today is counsel at Mayor Brown. He has worked on more than 200 cases before the US Supreme Court, arguing 31 of those cases, and has handled hundreds of additional cases before the federal and state appellate courts, arguing in virtually every federal, federal appellate circuit. In addition, Charles is a founder and co-director of the Yale Law School Supreme Court Clinic, one of the country's most successful appellate advocacy programs. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, Charles clerked for Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman and served as assistant to the Solicitor General in the United States Justice Department. Charles also served as the counsel on record for the amicus brief for historians and legal scholars supporting respondents in the Bladensburg case. And of course, our journalist today um, is Adam Liptak, who almost needs no introduction. Adam is the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times. A graduate of Yale Law School, he practiced law for 14 years before joining the New York Times news staff in 2002. He was a finalist for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in explanatory reporting. He taught courses on the Supreme Court and the First Amendment at several law schools, including Yale and the University of Chicago. Now I will turn the floor over to Adam. Thank you again, and we look forward to a great discussion today. So when I was invited to join you guys and moderate this uh, terrific panel, I had a terrible flashback to that morning in late June when this decision landed. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, and these days, they want you to file a story very, very fast. But I would like to do a dramatic reading of what, to my mind, was the key part of the decision. 
Alito J. announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respect to Part 1, 2B, 2C, 3, and 4, in which Robert C. J. and Briar Kagan and Kavanaugh J. joined, and an opinion with respect to Parts 2A and 2D, in which Robert C. J., Briar, and Kavanaugh joined. Breyer filed a concurring opinion in which Kagan joined. Kavanaugh filed a concurring opinion. Kagan filed an opinion concurring in part. Thomas J. filed an opinion concurring in the judgment. Gorsuch J. filed an opinion concurring in the judgment in which Thomas J. joined. Ginsburg J. filed a dissenting opinion in which Sotomayor J. J. joined. In other words, it's, it's what uh, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist was one, once heard to remark, that there appeared to be more opinions than there were justices. <laughs> and I could have used uh, the expert guidance of this panel in short order of trying to make sense exactly what had happened in this case. Um, Caitlin, why don't you explain it to me? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll, tr I'll try. So fortunately, we had seven opinions in this case, so not quite nine. Um, and I think everyone was sort of watching this case to see what test the court would announce. And lower courts are definitely going to have to do some nose counting in this case to figure out what exactly the holding is. Um, but before we get into the test, I think it might be helpful just for anyone who's not super familiar with the facts of this case to just give you some of the relevant facts. Um, the cross at issue in this case is a World War I memorial in Bladensburg, Maryland. It was erected between 1918 and 1925 by a group of private citizens, some of whom were Gold Star Mothers, um, to honor the 49 men in Prince George's County, Maryland, who died in World War I. Um, the, the monument was, was in the possession and control of the American Legion until about the 1960s when um, the commission, in this case, the Parks and Planning Commission of Maryland, took ownership of the memorial and the tract of land on which it sat for traffic safety reasons. Um, and so given these, these atmospherics, I think a lot of people going into the court's decision thought that the cross would definitely stand. The real, the real question was what test the court would apply. Um, but I, as much as the facts seem to be on our side in this case, I think it's really important to note, and this does not get a lot of attention, that Prior to the court's decision in this case, no court had ever upheld a cross-shaped memorial on public land. Um, there were some district court cases upholding crosses, but ultimately all of them were reversed on appeal. And in other contexts, crosses also didn't fare very well. There have been some cases challenging crosses on county seals, on state flags, and in almost all of those cases, the crosses were found to be unconstitutional. And in this case, the Fourth Circuit came very close to saying that there is a per se rule against crosses on public land. So going from that to the court deciding seven to two that a 32 foot tall cross shaped memorial in the middle of a busy intersection can stand is a pretty huge shift in the law. Um, and I think when we look back at some of the, course, the court's more recent establishment clause cases, we can, we can really see how far we've come. So if you take Van Orden, Van Orden was sort of a similar case where the monument at issue seemed to be um, sort of factually in line with the court's prior precedents. It had been unchallenged for four decades. It was situated in a park that was, I think, like 22 acres with, with other secular monuments around it. It had a lot of really good facts that made it seem like an easy case. Um, but the court was 5-4 to uphold the monument, so it really wasn't an, e an easy decision. Um, and now, fast forward to today, where we have a cross upheld by 7-2, to two, I think it shows you how far the, the court has come. And, and that change, I don't think, is, is just because the Chief Justice has replaced Justice Rehnquist or because Justice Alito replaced Justice O'Connor. I think it's also because Justice Kagan replaced Justice Stevens. Um, and I think for a lot of the justices, there's this sense that the Lemon Test is just not working. If it is commanding the court to tear down 100-year-old war memorials, and if it is saying that crosses can never be OK on public land, it just can't be the right test. Um, and then just the last thing I'll say with respect to the test, there's obviously a lot of different opinions here. And as I said, the, the lower courts will have to sort of sort through that to figure out how to apply the court's opinion in different circumstances. But we count six votes in favor of overruling Lemon, at least as it applies in the context of passive displays, um, long-standing monuments, and any other sort of practice that has a long-standing history in our, in our country's uh, tradition and history. Um, and so we think the case is really a win. We, we now have a presumption in favor of the constitutionality 
of, of monuments, at least <coughs> monuments with a significant history. We have the court moving from a place where we've never upheld a cross on public land to upholding a 32 foot tall cross in the middle of a busy roadway. Um, and we have the court overruling Lemon, at least as it applies to these kinds of monuments. Um, and I think also the court came out specifically and said that there's nothing so inherently religious about a cross that it can never by, by be um, constitutional under the Establishment Clause. And that, that's a, a pretty huge shift in the law. So I don't think that this is certainly the court's last word on these issues. There's a lot that needs to be parsed through, and the lower courts will need to do that. We're already seeing some of the lower courts doing that in the, in the Third Circuit. Um, but it's definitely a step back toward the original understanding of the Establishment Clause, which is a good thing for this peace cross, but it's also a really great thing for the law more generally. Caitlin, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, but maybe not everybody in the room knows what the lemon test is. Would you, just to, to set the table on that, because I think that's going to come up throughout the discussion. What's, what's the lemon test? And did the court, of, I agree with you that there were six votes, but they didn't quite overrule it, did they? So, so the lemon test is, it was originally articulated as looking at the, um, the practice, the monument, dis the displays, purpose, effect, and whether it creates excessive entanglement. Justice O'Connor has sort of modified that, and the way the Lemon Test stood going into American Legion was the court is supposed to look at whether the particular practice or monument at issue um, has the purpose or effect of endorsing religion or creates excessive entanglement between government and religion. Um, the majority opinion, I mean, it's right that the majority opinion you know, sort of praised the, the court's attempt to fashion a test that would apply across all different kinds of establishment clause cases, um, but ultimately concluded that it just doesn't work here. Um, and I think we have, I do think we have six votes saying it doesn't apply in the context of uh, monuments like this that are longstanding, that have a place in our, in our nation's history and traditions. Um, whether the Lemon Test applies outside of that context is less clear. Uh, and the majority opinion certainly didn't didn't say so, but we we have some strong con concurrences, sort of pushing for the lemon test to be just overruled completely. So, David, how did you uh, work your way through and harmonize these seven opinions? Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually still in the process of doing so, <laughs> and I've, I've I've read it many times. Uh, but I I do agree. I, I don't think there was a strict overruling. I guess I should say I agree with both of you. Um, trying to practice here, us all getting along. Uh, but um, there was not six votes to overrule, but there was six votes to say lemon does not apply in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have commemorative or ceremonial um, displays or symbols or practices, the court said uh, lemon doesn't apply. Um, so I, I think that's good news. What I wanted to do for a few minutes, though, is, is kind of put some of that into context uh, by going back to the development of um, where the lemon test came from and the beginning of the Establishment Clause um, as we know it uh, in the 1940s with a quick synopsis of, of how we got to where we are today. And so <clears throat> what I want you all to see is the, the change in the court's language, uh, the change in the court's tone, and um, the aggressiveness uh, by which they kind of the lemon was fantastic for a while, and then I think it went even more sour than it was. And, and you'll hear this from some of the quotes starting from uh, the infamous Everson case, which is where uh, the, the uh, um, separation of church and state, if you will, the Establishment Clause got incorporated um, to, as applied to the states. <clears throat> so in the 1940s and 50s, the kind of language you would get from the Supreme Court was, uh, the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state, that wall must be kept high and impregnable. Uh, we could not approve the slightest breach. This is kind of where all this started from, very strict view of, of, of separation. <clears throat> and so far as interference with the free exercise of religion and an establishment of religion are concerned, the separation must be complete and unequivocal. The First Amendment within the scope of its coverage permits no exception. The prohibition is absolute. So these are the 40s and 50s. This was the language in the first Establishment Clause cases. The object of separating church and state was to create a complete and permanent separation of the spheres of religious activity and civil authority by comprehensively forbidding every form of public aid or support for religion. So that's where uh, the Lemon Test steps in. Um, and as Caitlin mentioned, uh, they kind of gathered the test in a case called Lemon versus Kurtzman in 1970, and they pulled some different factors from previous cases, and that's where you get the three prongs of the test, um, having a secular purpose, can advance or inhibit religion, or can have excessive government entanglement with religion. 
But then you see going after from the 70s into the 80s and 90s where the court starts backtracking, backtracking a little bit. Um, so you, you see Justice O'Connor, for example, saying, well, experience proves that the Establishment Clause, like the Free Speech Clause, cannot easily be reduced to a single test. So that's the kind of the first sign of, well, maybe it's not all about Lemon, maybe there's, there's something else out there. There are different categories of Establishment Clause cases which may call for different approaches. I think that's correct. There's so many different types of Establishment Clause issues. I'm not sure that one test can cover everything, and I think they started to realize that um, when Lemon was going in, in different directions for uh, different cases. And then you start hearing the, uh, the rhetoric upticking a little bit. Our prior cases have used the three-part test articulated in Lemon as a guide to detecting two forms of unconstitutional government action. It has never been entirely clear, however, how the three parts of the test relate to the principles enshrined in the Establishment Clause. And so now Lemon is starting to take hits by several different justices. That was Justice O'Connor. Um, Lemon sought only to provide signposts. There's no fixed rule for Establishment Clause cases, again, backing away from Lemon. Um, the difficulties arise because the Lemon test has no more grounding in the history of the First Amendment than does the wall upon which the theory rests. So now, again, Lemon's being um, kind of undercut a little bit. When you get into uh, the 80s and 90s, which is kind of right before we get into the, 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 the Town of Greece case and, and the Bladensburg case and some of the more recent Establishment Clause cases, um, then we're, we're moving from uh, this is not just uh, an acknowledgement of religion, but the Lemon Test is actually becoming hostile to religion. It's actually taking and eradicating um, what we would have for, for example, the cross being up almost 100 years, and Lemon would say, no, you have to tear that down. Um, so uh, Justice Scalia said, there is a recent tendency in the opinions of this court to turn the Establishment Clause into a repealer of our nation's traditions and religious toleration. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is uh, Thomas, Justice Thomas. Even worse, the incoherence of the court's decisions in this area renders the Establishment Clause impenetrable and incapable of consistent application. So what you can see through the language from the court is uh, it started in the 1940s, 1947 uh, with this, this strict notion of, of separation of church and state, that the, you know, the high and impregnable wall, it can't be penetrated, no aid at all from government, no encouragement of religion, no participation. Um, and then throughout the decades, and it took several decades to get to, wait a minute, uh, this isn't working. Um, critics of the Lemon Test have been from all sides of the aisle, all different justices and, and scholars, um, just basically that it's not workable. And especially as it moved into uh, Justice O'Connor's endorsement test, you know, a reasonable observer, do they see an endorsement of religion? Well, you know, that's in the eye of the beholder if there ever, if there other was a test that was so. Um, you couldn't predict if you were a government agency what I can and can't do based on this test because you don't know what judge is gonna get the case. And as I learned very early on in law school, the reasonable observer was the judge, <laughs> right? Because that's the one who decides whether this violates the, the Establishment Clause. And so it all became, it depends on who you got on your, on, your, you know, on your case or on your panel, whatever it happened to be. And so I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the Lemon Test has kind of grown out of favor, which is just difficult to apply. And it doesn't give the clarity that the Supreme Court is supposed to give. Um, when you're looking for an opinion from the court, the idea is to take, you know, there's conflicting uh, decisions in different circuits, and the court says, okay, we're gonna make sure this is all uniform for federal law across the country, and so we're gonna issue a decision, everybody knows what to do from this point on, and that was just not happening. And I think that's one of the reasons why you've seen the court uh, move away from that strict establishment clause to the, the new tests that talk about uh, history and tradition and acknowledge of our religious heritage, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, speaking of history and tradition, Charles, I'm hoping you'll offer a dissenting view. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, <laughs> and, and first, I thank ADF for inviting me and letting me participate in this, and thank Jones Day for hosting us in this spectacular setting. Um, I'll, and I'll make three quick points at the beginning here. Um, you know, first, to pick up on what Adam had said, I'll put in a pitch for the brief that uh, we filed with the Yale Supreme Court Clinic. Uh, in uh, the Bladensburg case on behalf of a distinguished group of uh, legal historians and law professors, uh, which agreed that we should look at the constitutional history in interpreting the First Amendment, and we focused on the views of the principal framers on sectarian expressions by government and by government officials, looking especially at 
the views of Madison and Jefferson, who were instrumental in, in writing the First Amendment, and at George Washington. Um, and what we found, and I think our brief shows, I, I think persuasively, is that they had views that by modern, modern terms are strikingly liberal. They, they were, they regarded the, the United States and the, the colonies and the new, the new nation as being a religious, um, as having a religious background, but they were very deeply skeptical of sectarian expressions by uh, the government, by government officials. And you sort of see this in, you think, in, in the Declaration of Independence, which refers to our creator, but it's no reference to Jesus Christ, to Christianity in general, uh, to any particular religion or sect. Uh, you see it in the Constitution, which remarkably for a government document at, the at that time has no reference to religion at all, except for it its rejection of religious uh, tests. Um, and you see it in, in the presidential proclamations of George Washington, of Madison, of Jefferson, which contain general references, again, to our creator or to providence, but no, 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 um, uh, no mention at all of any particular religion of, of Christ, of Christianity, um, and again, quite striking for, for the time. Uh, and so our sense was that there is no doubt that the Latin cross is a preeminent uh, um, symbol of Western Christianity, that to say that it's really not religious is, is as some courts have said, sort of insulting to people, who, to believers, um, and that Madison, Jefferson, and Washington would have been deeply hostile to that kind of display on, on public lands. Um, secondly, having said that, um, like uh, as with Caitlin, we expected, fully expected that the court would approve the display of the cross, and the question was what test the court was going, going to use. Um, our concern was that the court would adopt the coercion test, uh, which was pressed with alarming persuasiveness by Caitlin and Mike Carvin for the American Legion and by, by the Solicitor General, or, or that it might adopt the test that was pushed by Professor McConnell for the Beckett Fund, a kind of historical characteristics of, of established religion. Um, and as those of you who follow this know, uh, you know, Beckett is very well respected, highly regarded by the court, um, and our, our view and I'm sure we'll talk about this later on today, was that those tests are, are in fact ahistorical and can lead to, in our sense, sort of alarmingly close association between government and religion, not just religion in general, but particular religions. And so we regarded the somewhat wishy-washy and, as Adam ex described, deeply confusing outcome of the Bladensburg case as actually kind of a successful result. Um, Third, the Bladensburg kind of kits down the road, leaves open the hard questions that are going to be coming, coming down, down the pipe. Um, and as Linda Greenhouse, you know, Adam's kind of quasi-colleague at the Times, uh, wrote last week, uh, the court used Bladensburg as a warm-up exercise while the justices took one another's measure on the subject that lies at the heart of the country's culture wars. Um, I, for the reasons that, that, that my colleagues have discussed, you know, I think we know that the lemon test is more or less dead in many of its applications, but we don't really have a good sense of what's going to be coming to replace it. You know, we may have a much better sense of that at the end of this current Supreme Court term. There's now one you know, pending case, the Espinoza case, uh, which is you know, quite an important case, which could give us some clear guidance as to what the justices think. Um, and there are a number of additional important First Amendment cases that are kind of insert pipeline that the court's going to be acting on soon, and we'll get a sense from that, I think, maybe even more than from Espinoza, where the court's going to be going. Uh, you know, my own completely uninformed personal view, uh, looking at Bladensburg, is that Justice Kagan is trying to put together a kind of centrist group on the court to address establishment clause and maybe First Amendment clause issues that contain not just her, Justice Breyer, but maybe also the chief and Justice Kavanaugh, and to some extent Justice Alito, you know, anchored on the left by Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor, and on the right by Justices Thomas and Gorsuch, is the lineup that we saw in, in the Bladensburg case. Uh, and my guess is that Justice Kagan will have some success in this. Um, you know, on the current court, you know, a centrist group is further, closer to the right than to the left, and so I think Justice Kagan will lose a lot of cases. And Town of Greece, which we had mentioned, I think it's an example of where the court may be going uh, very often in, in establishment clause cases coming up, and I think Justice Kagan will lose cases like that. But she may have some success in keeping the court from taking a, sort of a radical departure in establishment clause context. And that, if I were forced to make a prediction, that would be it.
Caitlin, Char <coughs> Charles mentioned the coercion test, which Mike Carvin, in characteristically vigorous fashion, pressed <laughs> on the court. Arguing side by side with him on the same side of the case, but making a more modest argument, was Neil Katyal representing the government defendants, who seemed to be arguing for what looks to me like maybe what the core holding of the case was, that if it's really old, it comes out of the First World War, we associate crosses in the field of Flanders with a kind of unmoored from religion memorial function, then it's okay. But feel free to press back against that characterization. But the, am I right in thinking that the court was closer, at least in this decision, to the Katyal uh, position than the Carvin position? I think there's certainly good reason to say that. I, I would note, too, that um, in our petition for certiorari, we were, we were arguing to a, a, a different court. Justice Kennedy was still on the court. And in our petition, we really pressed for a presumption of constitutionality. That was something that was very important for us to get, to get in the court's opinion. Um, because, you know, when you look at other constitutional contexts, other constitutional rights, there is a presumption that the government is acting constitutionally. And that makes sense um, because it's, it's not to be taken lightly to say that the government is violating a person's individual freedoms. Um, and so we just didn't think it made sense to treat the Establishment Clause any differently. Um, and so we, we were happy at the end to see that presumption language appear in the, in the court's opinion because we felt like that was something we were really pressing at the cert stage. Um, Obviously, then we got Justice Kavanaugh, and I think the thinking was, let's push this and see how far um, we can get with the coercion test, because you know I think there's a lot of people who agree with Justice Thomas and, and Judge McConnell um, that sort of these hallmark um, sort of indicators of coercion are really what the founders were, were thinking of. The way I saw um, the commission's argument and their briefing was to sort of keep the court deciding just this case that was in front of them and not make any real broad pronouncements of law. Um, they, they certainly didn't get that. I think the court obviously took took a step toward getting rid of Lemon for this category of cases and, and articulating a, a new rule, at least as it applies to um, longstanding monuments, kind of extending town of Greece to this context. Um, but, I, but I do think that the commission ultimately did not, you know, we, we, we didn't end up with a sort of broad pronouncement on the law that we would have liked. Um, and if I could just respond to one thing that Charles said that, yeah. that struck me. Um, you know, I, I think maybe this is sort of just a different perspective on some of the founding history that, that I read in your brief. Um, I think it, it's certainly right that our founders um, sort of knew the dangers of, of uh, religious fervor and, and sects and the sort of divisiveness that that could cause. But my reading of our founders kind of avoiding sectarian language um, was more, is more sort of a function of good governance and political acumen than it is you know, a, a statement that they believed that sectarian language would violate the, the Establishment Clause. Um, so you know, John Adams uh, realizing that maybe he, he lost the, the presidency because he, he talked about Jesus too much is more a function of the fact that the, you know, people didn't like that. He was speaking to a diverse body of people who have sort of different beliefs and different doctrines. And politically, it wasn't smart for him to do that. But I, I didn't read it as him thinking that that would have been a violation of the Establishment Clause for him to, to speak in those terms. Oh, well, I, as kind of any discussion of history, you can look at it in a number of ways, and it's very hard to know, to, to just kind of psychoanalyze what the framers were thinking about. You know, our sense was just looking at what the framers did, what, again, particularly Washington, Madison, Jefferson, uh, they were very, very careful not to use sectarian language. And you would have thought that if they th believed that references to religion and to sects in particular, um, to particular religions, what was permissible, you would have seen some of that, either in what government did at the time, what they did during their presidencies, the things that they said as president. Uh, and they were very, very careful not to do that. Um, and I think Madison in particular, and of course he's the author of the First Amendment, what was, was very, very clear that he thought that that kind of involvement of government with particular religions was, was very, very dangerous and something to be avoided. Um, and the reference to John Adams, which is was sort of interesting, he, John, he was the, the only one of the first three presidents who actually did make uh, religious references in his proclamations. And after he lost for re-election, he kind of said he, was, he regretted having done it, and he thought that his loss was, could be attributable to the fact that he was too excessively religious in his pronouncements. Um, and, and it's true that that does not necessarily reflect what he thought about the First Amendment, 
um, but it is, I think, suggestive of what the early framers and the principal framers, so far as the First Amendment were concerned, had in mind. So let me jump into that. Um, <clears throat> I, of course, take a, a different reading. Shocked you. Um, I, I know it is. I know it is surprising. Uh, the reason I don't think that's so is I, I think, first of all, I think we we uh, have to define sectarian a little bit better than we do. Uh, I think we kind of throw that around. Is it is it uh, a sect of Christianity, um, sectarianism? Uh, does it mean religious and non-religious? Uh, it seems to be when I read your briefing, when you look for uh, whether it's legislative prayer, uh, as you, you made the same argument in the Town of Greece case that you did in the Cross case, uh, that, it, that these prayers and these monuments should be inclusive and non-sectarian. Well, what does that mean? So does that mean inclusive and non-religious? Well, of course, the prayer is going to be religious, so if you're making it non-religious, it's no longer a prayer. Um, so I don't think it could be that. Sectarianism back in the day was different sects of Christianity. Christianity is not a sect, it's a religion. And so I, I think one of the issues is we have to be careful in throwing that word around. I think the other thing is I, it's, it's hard for me to see that uh, raising the name of Jesus was a violation of the Establishment Clause, considering that uh, the many, many years of legislative prayer from the very beginning of our country, um, prayed to Jesus Christ. If that was a violation of the Establishment Clause, you think they would have stopped it immediately? So I do agree that there were, they were trying to be careful in some of their language. I don't think because they thought it was violation of the Establishment Clause. I thought they were trying to be inclusive. I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. But we can't be inclusive so far as to say um, what prayer there would be in town of Greece or what display there would be that's religious, but yet satisfies every religion out there, including atheism. Uh, obviously, one of your clients in the town of Greece was an atheist. And so I think that part has to be kept uh, under consideration that it wasn't the mere mention of a specific deity uh, that violated the, the, the separation of church and state as they used them often. So what, what we know from the case for sure, I think, is that uh, a really old cross that's a war memorial does not have to be removed from public land because of the objection of passersby. <clears throat> What do you think the answer is as a positive legal matter and should be as a normative legal matter to may uh, a government erect a war memorial cross today to memorialize uh, the more diverse troops that uh, fight in, uh, say, Iraq and Afghanistan? Let's, let's go down the line and, and let me ask sure. you that question. So you, I think you see... Um you know, Justice Justices Breyer and Justice Gorsuch, um, Justice Kavanaugh, all all trying to parse out how this would apply in other contexts. Um, Justice Gorsuch specifically sort of recognizes that, in his view, it's a problem that that the majority opinion uses so much language about the longstandingness of this monument. Um, and I think that there is language in the majority opinion that could cause lower courts to 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 think that this test only applies to long-standing monument, monuments. And then you sort of get into the question of, well, how long-standing is long-standing enough? Um, Justice Breyer doesn't seem to think that this applies beyond um, long-standing monuments, or at least he's not ready to say that yet, and he, he says that in his concurrence. Um, so I think lower courts will have to sort of um, flesh that out and kind of take take a risk when when they are ruling on newer monuments. I think that as a you know what what I think that the test should be going forward. I think probably the most realistic version of the test is the one that's articulated by Justice Gorsuch, which is essentially that the age of the monument is not what matters here. It's um, whether whether the the way the monument is used is co in compliance with our nation's history and our nation's tradition. So it's more the age of the traditions and the history and the use than it is the age of the actual monument. So th 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 the last few sentences you said uh, were a little hard for me to track. As a, you seem to be saying that a, a war memorial cross today might well be okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And and my. One word response, although it'll be longer and I'll elaborate on it, is Justice Kagan. Um, Justice Kagan does, uh, I think, a great job of inserting herself into the majority to um, alter the opinion a little bit, uh, to make it less drastic, less dramatic, uh, and I think smartly so on, 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 on her side and her point of view. So, for example, <clears throat> you know, something that's near and dear to my heart is the infamous footnote in Trinity. 
um, which you know was was put in there to basically say, well, Trinity is is you know limited to its facts about about not funding playground use, which Justice Gorsuch responded by saying, well, that's silly. You know, all of our cases have to do with a specific set of facts, but they all are ruled on on broader principles. And my point to that is is that. You, that's what you get instead of having an opinion now that's clear that says, look, monuments have to satisfy this test. Now we have a case that says, well, old monuments satisfy the test, which is, brings a, a lack of clarity. And so now you have to litigate what happens with new monuments. And of course, some of the justices say, well, that's really not how it works. It can't be that if you put up a monument 40 years ago, it's constitutional, but 39 years ago, it's not. It can't be. And so I think what happens is, is it raises more problems than it solves um, by, by inserting the footnote in Trinity, because now I think, as you mentioned, Espinoza hopefully will put a knife throat right through that footnote in Trinity um, when it rules on a, a similar type of funding case. Um, but it creates more litigation because there's not as much clarity of saying, okay, this is the rule uh, that we're gonna lay down, this is the test that it's gonna be. It always kind of pulls back a little bit and leaves more you know, questions for another day. And, and it, it may be, I should say, that the question is a little hypothetical because when I, I went to an American Legion Hall in a rare instance of, uh, of actual reporting that I engaged in um, <laughs> and, and talked to some folks there who felt very strongly that this cross should stand. But when I asked, well, would you put up a cross today? They said, no, we, we, don't, we don't think a cross today would be appropriate in light of the, the much more diverse set of faiths that our fighting men and women have. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear that this issue will arise directly anytime soon. Uh, but Charles, I'd like to know your views, and I hope they're different than the uh, other. Yes, you, you will not be astonished to hear that. And I, I think both that um, it should not be constitutional, and I think the court would not hold that it is constitutional if, in fact, uh, some governmental organization somewhere, and, and you know, there are so many different governments across the United States, you know, local governments, state governments, the, the federal government, that it, it would not be shocking if you know some government somewhere, some outlier government, notwithstanding the, the your reporting at the American Legion, uh, tried to erect something like this. Um, I, I, my, my sense is that uh, you know we have clearly Justice Breyer believes that history, in terms of, of the, the, the length of time that the monument has been in existence, matters. I think Justice Kagan does. It was part, part of the analysis that Justice Alito put into his opinion. Um, so. You know, my, my sense more generally, and this is an aspect of that, is that the court is kind of moving to a know it when you see it sort of a test for these kinds of things. And all, part of that is the reaction that people have to the, to the monument or to the display, whatever it is. And that's gonna be, be affected in a substantial degree by how long it's been there. The fact that it's been there since World War I, obviously the justices looked at this and thought it would be odd to tear this thing down now that it's been there for 100 years and it really hasn't created that much of a problem. Um, I think now, if one were to erect a, a, a Latin cross as a monument for people who lost their lives in Iraq or Afghanistan, which includes you know, not only Western Christians, but you know, Eastern Orthodox and Jews and Hindus and an increasing number of Muslims, I, I think that that would create quite a different reaction on the part of the public for the reasons that, that your visit to the American Legion suggested. And if, if a government tried to erect the cross, I think it would create a very different reaction. And that would influence the the response of at least, I think, seven of the justices. I also, go ahead. I was just gonna say, which is an odd constitutional test of we know it when we see it. It not only is, you know, not lemon, it's worse than lemon. Um, there's no guideposts at all. And I'm not saying it wouldn't happen, but it's, it's not, I think, what the court should be doing. Um, they used to say, was that, I don't know if that was the, the definition for pornography or something like that back in the day. You know, well, we, we know it when we, uh, you know, obscenity, we know it when we'll see it. That can't be a constitutional test for, uh, to give guidance to governments, and there's so many government agencies at all different levels, uh, to know what to do. Um, I, I think that, I, I do think that, it may not be politically wise, you know, always to put up a cross now. I'd have a hard time believing if a cross was put up, it, it would be unconstitutional. Um, I think it would still carry under the same test. Uh, but there's a lot going on, as, as we all know, every time an opinion is issued. I think with this court, um, you're not gonna see extremely broad opinions that just take away precedent in one fell swoop uh, or overturn precedent. I think what you're gonna see is gradual steps and I think that's what we do see here. I think we see that with the Establishment Clause. I think we see it with the Free Exercise Clause. So I don't see this as minor. It's interesting how you thought this was a good result. Um, I certainly appreciate that perspective. Um, I, I, I don't know how it was, and the reason is it would have been 
very drastic for it to be for the, the cross to be taken down. Uh, the fact that it was upheld and and reinforced as being constitutional and according to history and tradition, uh, I think is a, is a very important ruling, and I think it's only going to continue to move in that direction. And if I could just add, add a footnote to that, um, you, you know, I, I'm not embracing the know-it-when-you-see-it standard, which has the problems that, that you identify, and I think Justice Stewart got so, so much grief for mentioning that in the obscenity context that no one will ever say it again on the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think that the reality is that there are so many different factors that can go into all these <clears throat> cases. There are so many different factual things that are going on in all these cases. Um, and when you sort of read kind of the set of cases that, that you know, Caitlin mentioned <clears throat> um, initially uh, and that you mentioned, yeah, there are all there are lots of different things that are going on in these cases. There's there's history and there's the the, the factual context, um, and there's the public response. and And the justices kind of going to pick the pieces that they find most most amenable to the outcome that they want. Um, in a case like Town of Town of Greece, they did that. Justice Leto did that, I think, in his opinion, in in the Gallo in in the Bladensburg case. So uh, although you don't call it, know it when you see it. I mean, in fact, they are they are affected by the context of the case, the factual context of the case, and they then pull the different pieces together that they, that they think leads to the right outcome. As you suggest, Charles, there's something visceral about removing a, a monument uh, that's maybe different from deciding whether to erect one. And the Alito opinion says that the removal itself has uh, an expressive component of hostility toward religion. And as I recall, the Fourth Circuit suggested that one solution might be to saw the arms off the cross, which probably was not to everyone's liking. Do, do, do any of those arguments resonate with you? Uh, well, well the, the, the sawing of the arms off, I think, was kind of such a shocking and repulsive idea that, that uh, nobody was prepared to defend that. Um, I think not even the, uh, the, the, the people who challenged the cross in the first place. Um, I, I, I think that the, the if you believe in the know it when you see it kind of approach to these cases that you're taking the different strands. Uh, the fact that it would have, it would, it would generate a, a negative reaction to take the cross down, I think does have some salience there because it, it kind of reflects, a, it, if it's been there for, forever and people live with it, are not obviously upset by it, to then tear, suddenly tear it down a century later kind of reflects a hostility to religion, which I think plays into, in, into the formula. So I think that that does make some, some degree of sense. Um, but again, that's just sort of another strand that, that a justice can, can seize on to support the result that they believe in. Mm -hmm. it, it, let me ask Caitlin and David, if, if a municipality were to decide uh, to erect a war memorial monument using the symbol of, uh, of, a, of a fringe religion, maybe the Church of Sumum, remember them? Would that, that would be just as acceptable as a cross? Yeah, I mean, so I think under the, the court's opinion, what you'd have to do is look to see whether um, this religious symbol is being used to to exploit or to to denigrate other people and other religions, whether it's sort of causing division. And I think that that's something that is particularly important to Justice Breyer when he's looking at these kinds of cases. Um, but assuming that it's not, um, assuming that it is, you know, being used in good faith to commemorate the the war dead, if um, for whatever war this is, I think that that would be perfectly constitutional. And I think there's a good analogy to um, the legislative prayer cases. And, and, and I know you right. represented, um, you were co-counsel in the case for the respondents in that, in that case. And that would be the same thing as far as if you are allowing legislative prayer, um, you know, is it okay to allow all different types of religions to pray at whether it's local or state or federal, and the answer is, is absolutely so. And so I, I still think even though it's a different religion, it's got to be the same test as long as it's consistent with history and tradition, um, and you're not doing it for because you're in one location and you're trying to push that religion, you know, we get back into that again. Um, I think it is permissible in, in these contexts. Any concluding thoughts on the cross case before we pivot forward toward uh, the, the upcoming docket? I mean, the only the only thing that that I would say is, um, and and I'd be interested in hearing Charles' thought. Um, when we, when we talk about the briefs that you that you filed in both Town of Greece and in the Bladensburg Cross, um, you talk about inclusivity and non-sectarian. And I guess when when as as I read that and I thought about that, which I have for 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 several years now since the Town of Greece case, is I'm not sure how you get there. And what I mean by that is. There was a colloquy, if you remember, with Professor Laycock when he was arguing the, the town of Greece case. 
And it was the same argument. He was arguing, well, these prayers have to be non-sectarian and they have to be inclusive. And so the justices um, uh, were having a little bit of fun with it, if you remember Justice Scalia. But they were saying, uh, on a serious note, tell me how you, uh, how you uh, arrange your prayer that's inclusive to everyone, that, that represents, and it's the same for displays, all different religions, and they name whether it's you know, Christianity and, and Islam and, and Buddhism and you know, all the religions and, and atheism. And, and how, do you, how do you get a prayer that satisfies everyone? Same question, how would you get a display that satisfies everyone? And then the answer was, well, uh, there's none that's satisfactory to the atheist, so the atheists are out. And so you know, one of the clients was out because the client is an atheist. And then, okay, if you pray to you know, Heavenly Father or Creator or some generic term as you, as you spoke about, well, what happens to the polytheists? Well, the polytheists are out. And so I, I guess my point is even trying to go that route, I'm not sure how it can be inclusive. You're still always cutting out religious people, non-religious people, um, and, and without even a test to apply. So that's the problem I had in trying to apply your test is I, I didn't know how to apply it because the question was, who do you leave out when you're trying to be inclusive and you're trying to be um, non-sectarian, I guess you would call it. Well, I, I guess our response at, in the Town of Greece case, which is a leg legislative prayer case, was that no one prayer is going to satisfy everybody uh, because, for the reason you say, um, and even if it's completely generic in its invocation of religion and re re religious dogma, the, the atheists are left out. I think the, the answer is you don't have one, any one prayer that does it. You have a, a, a open up the, the prayers to all different sects and to people and to non-believers as well to give some kind of initial invocation, which you can do in the prayer context. It's much more difficult to do in the symbol context than in the monument context, which is why I think that you can, cons you can have a an outcome in, in town of Greece, which is consistent with a rule that you cannot currently erect a Latin cross as a monument for kind of all war dead, um, because there really is no way to make that inclusive in a way which possibly could be done in the religious prayer context. But the, the only problem, I understand that, the only problem was is, is that's not the argument you made. The argument you made was you couldn't pray in the name of Jesus, not that you had, not that everyone could pray to their specific God, but that you couldn't use what you would call a sectarian name, and so you couldn't pray in the name of Jesus. So I would understand everybody gets to pray in the name of their deity, but my understanding of your argument was no deity could be mentioned, and it had to be some generic God somewhere without mentioning the deity, which obviously is not a prayer to most people. I, I have no recollection of that. <laughs> but I, I, I've there, got there, the brief right here. There, if you there, want to look there at were it. a lot of people who were involved in that brief, and Professor Laycock had, had his own views. Um, I, you know, I think that, that given that town of Greece is, is the law, um, I, I think reconciling the outcome there with our view going forward in, in monument cases is, is the one that I've expressed. And I, th and I think that the concern that, that you know, our side of the argument has with these kinds of situations is it's always going to be the majority. I mean, there is, a, major there is a, a religious majority in the United States, and in particular communities have different majorities. Um, and the in town of Greece is an example of this. They, they open their uh, legislative sessions to prayers Somehow, every prayer was given by, by a Christian um, and un until the litigation started challenging it. And that's what's going to happen in, in these locations to the extent that you say, uh, sure, you know, the, the Church of Sunum, Sunum can have their monument. No, no municipality is going to erect a monument to the Church of Sunum. They're going to erect a cross or maybe a Star of David if you're in, you know, in, in, in some, juris some jurisdictions that have Jewish majorities or... In, in Detroit, in some places you might have you know, a, 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 an Islamic symbol. But it's going to be, in our view, kind of exclusive to people who are not believers, uh, whatever the majority is in the jurisdiction that's uh, erecting the symbol. David, you mentioned that your fabulous victory in Trinity Lutheran was marred by a footnote. <laughs> um, say a little bit more about that, and then maybe you can set the table for this very interesting case coming up in the current term out of Montana called Espinoza. Sure. Um, Trinity Lutheran uh, was a case that dealt with both the uh, free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and more so the state establishment clause. They're generally called Blaine Amendments. And uh, at issue in Trinity was um, the, the state of Missouri had a recycling program where they recycled old tires, 
And what they would do is they would give reimbursement grants to not-for-profits that had playgrounds, and they would take the recycled tires and put them down uh, on the surfaces so when, when kids fell, they had a little bit of a rubberized surface so they wouldn't get hurt. And so they had an application process open to all not-for-profits, and um, the, the our client uh, applied for a reimbursement grant, filled out the very long government application with a million questions, was ranked in the top five, was actually awarded a reimbursement grant until the state saw that this playground was operated by a church. And so the church ran the school and, and they said, well, now you're, um, you can't get this reimbursement grant because of the so-called separation of church and state, the state Blaine Amendment. And so we sued under the free exercise clause and the Supreme Court basically held that if the, the church school was otherwise qualified for this reimbursement grant, which they were, they satisfied all the neutral and secular criteria that the government wanted, then the, the government could not exclude them solely because they were a religious organization. And arguments made from the other side were, well, they're a church and everything they do is religious, and even though this is a playground, it's going to help fund you know, evangelizing and proselytizing and all these, all these different things. And the court said, no, you can't exclude a religious organization um, solely because they're religious from an otherwise neutral government benefit. The footnote put in, 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 in I think, to, to, to possibly garner additional votes, basically said, well, all we're ruling on today is that in the context of funding for uh, a playground, you can't exclude a religious organization, and we're not talking about other types of religious discrimination. So that's the footnote. Um, it was only signed on by a plurality, only four justices signed on, yet somehow lower courts read that as, as uh, being some sort of holding from the court, but that's my own thing. Um, but Justice Gorsuch responded and said, well, you know, for what it's worth, it's true. But so is every case dealing with the facts that are at hand, but we decide cases based on constitutional principles, and that constitutional principle applies beyond um, just the funding of playgrounds. Lower courts have gone both ways. Some lower courts have said it's not limited by the footnotes. Some have said it is limited by the footnotes. Um, that's the know it when you see it test kind of thing. That's where it ends up, and that's one of the problems with the footnote. The Espinoza case, which I hopefully is going to get rid of that footnote, is a recent case the court just took where um, the Montana set up a tax credit for, for student scholarships, and the tax credit basically goes to all private schools, religious and secular, and also to public schools. Uh, a private person can donate to what's called an SSO, uh, which is a private organization that then gives the money to the child, whether they attend a religious school uh, or a secular school. And then the, the state, Department of Revenue, said, wait a minute, you can't give it to religious schools. It violates, it violates the, our, our Blaine Amendment, and some parents sued and said, no, that's discrimination under the free exercise clause. Um, we should be able to get the same benefits. You are, again, treating us differently solely because we're religious. And the Montana Supreme Court upheld that and struck down the tax credits going to all private schools, religious and secular, kept in the funding going to uh, public schools. And so the Supreme Court just took that case. My hope and prayer is that they took that to say, we meant what we said in Trinity, pay no attention to the footnote. So say a little more about Blaine Amendments. What's their history? So Blaine Amendments, um, long story short, is there was, um, back in the early days, there was actually government money funding uh, schools, and most schools at the beginning of our country when schools came into being were religious schools. And so there was government funding of religious schools, uh, okay with the Establishment Clause back then. Um, but what happened was is, is there started to be a lot of influx of Catholics, and the Catholics were, were forming their own schools and demanding, you know, that same money. If, look, if you're giving money to private schools and, and Christian schools and, and the different denominations that were there, um, then we should have the same, the same type of funding. Uh, and there was a pushback against that. And so these Blaine Amendments were adopted in different, uh, uh, different formats. There was Senator Blaine who pushed them. They tried to get a federal Blaine Amendment, which didn't work. But I think about 39 states actually adopted them which was called the strict no aid clause. Basically, the Blaine Amendments say uh, no public money in any, f any form can be given either directly or indirectly to, um, to sectarian schools. And sectarian then meant Catholic, which is why I kind of took issue right. with just throwing out the word sectarian. But sectarian meant Catholic. And recently, the court is saying that's just anti-Catholic bigotry when you say this has to be uh, non-sectarian, because that's what they were focusing on, uh, is not giving any money to the, the Catholic schools. And they came about in 
um, state constitutions, either by when, when a state came for statehood, they were required to put it in some of the states or they put it into their, uh, their state constitution. So I think there's about 39 Blaine amendments uh, that exist in, in, uh, in the different states. Charles, what's your reaction to this case? Uh, well, I think it's a very interesting case. I, I think that the likelihood that that court will uh, reverse the Montana Supreme Court is, is, as David said, very, very high. They presumably took the case to, to do that, and if they didn't have, there weren't five justices who had a pretty good sense that the court was going to come out that way, they probably wouldn't have denied cert in, in the first place. I, what, what makes it an interesting case, I, I think, is that the Montana Supreme Court threw out not just the funding for religious schools, but also the funding for non-religious private schools, so for all private schools. And that creates a, a question, you know, does this mean that there's going to be a, a one-way ratchet, that you don't have to create funding for private schools at all, but once you create funding for, once you authorize funding, permit funding for religious private schools, you can never take it away, um, since the state seems to have, the state Supreme Court seems to have done that in it although leaving the, the, the public schools funded, but, but took away, takes away funding from non-religious private schools, seemingly in an attempt to, to be even-handed in it. Uh, you know, what, what does that mean going forward for, for funding for religious schools or other kind of religious enterprises that, that are seemingly non-discriminatory uh, because other equivalent institutions are funded? If you want to then take it away from, the, from all the institutions, will this, this, this decision make that more difficult. And I think that, that will be the problem the court wrestle, wrestles with in the case. And I'm just remembering, I'm, I'm sure you guys know this, but that they, the court turned down what looked like a more incremental step about whether New Jersey could uh, uh, discriminatorily uh, give funds to rehabilitate uh, some kinds of structures but not churches. It's odd that they turn down that case and take this kind of bolder case. But I guess where I'm going with is, what's the limiting principle? All government programs must be available? Uh, put, put it this way, a state constitution that says, listen, other people can do it differently. We would like a fairly high wall of separation of church and state. They're, they're not free to do that, and all government programs uh, that provide funds to uh, non-religious organizations must be equally available to religious organizations? Is that the answer? Uh, I would say that um, the free exercise clause is the answer to the question. So they could make their wall as high as they'd like. The problem is it violates the federal free exercise clause. So for example, I, I don't think it's a one-way ratchet. I think it, it's, it's a, the way the program was set up. For example, in Montana, if they would have said we're only giving money to public schools, there would be no claim at all. What happened was is they gave, they opened it up to private schools, and then once you do so, if you say, we're not going to give it to religious private schools, even though you otherwise qualify, solely because you're religious, then that triggers the free exercise clause. So I think the answer is, 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 is it depends on how you set up the program in the first place. And once you say, we're going to give similar types of organizations this benefit, and you otherwise satisfy that, and then the only reason you're not getting it is because you're religious, uh, as they said in, in Trinity, that's odious to the Constitution. What does this case tell us about school vouchers? We know that school vouchers are permissible, but it sounds like a small step to say they're required. I mean, I, I, again, I, I think they would be depending on the context of the program. And, and, there's, and uh, there's, there's really no reason, Here's, let me flip it around a little bit. What's the reason to exclude religious schools? If you're giving money, and the court said in the Axto case years ago, Arizona a Christian School Tuition Organization versus Wynn that we litigated, is that when you give these type of, of private donations to these private schools, it's private money. It's not government money. So you shouldn't even be concerned with, well, are we funding religion? It doesn't even enter the question. So then the question of if, if we're saying we're going to exclude religious schools, why? There's no reason to. If you want a great education for all of the students in the state, then why would you say, except for you kids who decide to go to religious school? It's not furthering any government interest. It's actually going against it, because you want, I think you want all kids to be educated. So I think that shows what may be blatant hostility or written into the, the Blaine Amendments, people argue. That's just, that's just blatant hostility written into the Blaine Amendment, because it doesn't matter the context. You could never get it if you were going to a religious school. And how do you harmonize that point with Locke against Davey? which says that it's okay for uh, states to decline to fund students who want to study devotional theology. Yeah, I mean, uh, Locke versus Davey was the argument used in Trinity, and, and interestingly enough, the argument um, depend, uh, uh, relied upon by the Montana Supreme Court. Oddly enough, they relied on Locke versus Davey, which was before Trinity, 
but the Montana Supreme Court never mentioned Trinity, which I thought was, was pretty glaring. At least talk about it and say it doesn't apply rather than just ignore it. But Locke versus Davey was a completely different set of facts, and, and we argued this in, in the Trinity case was, in that case, there was a student that got a scholarship, and he qualified for the scholarship based on his grades and his income level, and um, it was taken away because he decided to do a, a, a devotional theology major. And what the court said was, you're allowed to go to a religious school, you're allowed to take religious classes, um, you're allowed to take a religious major. So what the court said, it went a long way to include religion. The one thing it couldn't do was take um, a, 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 theology, a devotional theology major, and that skinny slice was because of the historical concerns with the funding of, of clergy. And so it said, so in that context, and again, it was a 5-4 opinion and probably wouldn't come out the same way today, but that's a, a different question. Um, in that context, it was permissible because they went a long way to include religion, whereas Montana's case in Trinity, they didn't go a long way to include religion. If you were religious by identification, you were out, whereas in Locke versus Davy, you could still go to religious schools, still get the funding, still take a religious major, and so there's a lot more religion allowed in the Locke mm -hmm. versus Davy case.